And here we go. Here we go. Here we go. It is Wednesday night. It is 730 and it is time for another of our weekly episode of Conversations with Commodores. And this man who is my guest tonight needs no introduction. I'll just give you his jersey number in case you might have probably gotten it. Probably number 87, one of the most decorated, if not the most decorated Commodore in the last 50 years of our football program, Jordan Matthews. Welcome and thank you for having some time for us tonight, my friend. Glad to be here. Let's get to it. We are going to get to it. And I got off the jump, I got to know how are you related to Jerry Rice? Okay, so my mom is uh, from a small town, uh, Crawford, Mississippi. If this is Starkville, just mm -hmm. drive 20 minutes into the woods and you'll run to where my mom grew up. And so the school that they uh, all are from is like BL Moore High School, da -da -da, like that's that's the hotbed. So generally, when you get that far into the country, you relate mm -hmm. to everybody. You know what I'm saying? It's just backwards Mississippi, backwards Alabama. But mm -hmm. but actually, he is my mom's second cousin, which makes him obviously my first cousin right out there from Crawford, Mississippi. So back then, they called him Jerry World. Like they they have nicknames for him now. They call him Jerry World Rice because he could catch anything in the world. So. He was, um, I would say, as far as a football player, that was the first guy I really, like, looked up to and mm -hmm. kind of stole, like, a lot of his traits, how he practiced, things like that. So, yeah, that's family. And, and how about the fact that you ended up playing for the same team later on in your career? How was that? Crazy. Crazy. And it was, and it was wild because, you know, it, I really wish I could have had the same success that I had the Eagles that I had when I was with the Niners, but when I was there – dealt with a few injuries, switching positions to tight end, just it never really ended up manifesting into me being on the field. So now I'm trying to recreate some of that old success with the Panthers now. But um, every time I see him at the game, we'd always dap each other up, show each other some love. You know? But but Jerry's a busy man, and um, he's pretty much like a – he's an ambassador for that team. And every year when I was there pretty much, we made playoff runs. And Jerry's right there the whole time motivating the guys and kind of just – being that example of what champion looks like. So they got another chance at it this weekend too, you know, to get back to it. They sure do. Well, I got to ask you, while we're on the NFL part of this, yeah, you played for several of the teams that were in the final four this past right. week, Bills, Eagles, uh, 49. Who do you root for? How okay, so I, I'll tell you, if the if the Bills are in it, mm -hmm. Trent sure feels like family to me. Oh, sure. So sure. it – if Trent's in there, that's like my brother. I want, I don't want the Bills to win. Mm -hmm. Um, if the if Trent's not in there, one hundred percent, then it goes to the Niners. And I'm, and I'll tell you why. I feel like the Eagles still have a fresh one. You know what I'm saying? They have a fresh mm -hmm. one, and um, I just being there since 2019, I saw um the pain, you know, that that organization felt when the Chiefs came back and got us in that Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. When I tell you I was there, been there from 2019 all the way up to, like, you thought that pain was bad? Think about playing the Eagles and having no quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Like, it mm -hmm. was like going into a fight with both hands tied behind your back, right? And so I just remember, like, falling in love with the way Kyle Shanahan, like, coached football, how he ran the organization, John Lynch, how he treats people. And I was like, man, these guys deserve to host the Lombardi at some point because I, I truly believe this, right? Like, you, if you're in football, you should root for people doing it the right way because when they win, now it impacts other organizations. Like, when teams do it the wrong way and they have success, then you start hearing people say, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't worry about all that. Maybe, maybe you don't need to have you know, um, a, maybe you don't have to take care of the players as much when it comes to their bodies, you know what I'm saying, for practice. Maybe you don't have to feed them. Like, well, I say the 49ers are first class in the way they feed guys, first mm -hmm. class in recovery. Um, but also, when it comes to the field, first class coaches. D'Amico Ryans, Mike McDaniels, mm -hmm. you know, um, Kyle Shanahan. I was there when all those guys were in the building at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, John Embry, the guy who helped transition me over to tight end. I, my first two wide receiver coaches when I got there were Wes Welker and Miles Austin. Golly. I mean, wow. it's a it is a PhD coaching clinic yeah. when you're in that building. And so I just believe they deserve one. You know, I know some Eagles fans will kill me for saying that, but it's not because it's no love lost. 
to the uh to the to Philadelphia. I know they got a fresh one. You know, they still got guys in that locker room that mm -hmm. still have that Super Bowl on them when you talk about Kelsey, Lane, Fletcher. So I would love to see the Niners get one. But if the Bills are in there, if any team Trent Sherfield's on, yeah. I, I I'm pulling for them outside of my team. Oh, Jordan, I, I'm watching the game the other night, and his blocking is so elite for a wide receiver. Yeah. And I know that's why he stuck around as long as he has. He's so tough physically and mentally. Yeah. No. But but for the Niners, from the Vanderbilt standpoint, we got number 48, Oren Burks. We do. We do. He's and that's – and so that's – now, should I should actually segue to that. You know, Or, Oren on the 49ers, there's a guy named uh, Eric Harris, who I'm really close to as well. Um, he's a like special teamer. Uh, he's on practice squad right now. He's been elevated a couple times. He trains at where I train down in Florida. Mm -hmm. well, I talk about two exceptional men. Every, the whole Vanderbilt community knows about Ord and the type of guy he is. I think he could run for president one day and win. Mm -hmm. um, but Eric Harris is a really close friend of mine too. And I'm I'm still cool with a lot of those guys in that locker room. So George Kittle, I mean, like I went through some hard stuff, man. The torn ACL. Mm -hmm. Uh, being cut, brought back, cut, brought back, cut. It was almost you ever seen that Homer Simpson meme where he's like walking out the door, out of the bar, then he comes back. I can't tell you how many times people posted that whenever the 49ers were signed me, but every step of the way, man, Kittle would just send me something. If if something happened, I got released, he'd send me like, dang, bro, you know, miss you. When I got back or he'd hear I signed, he's sending me something in his own Kittle way, you know, um, smiley face or something. So I got really good friends um, on that sideline, but um, I love to see do Oren. No, there's not a more deserving guy of being a winner than Oren Burks. To another guy that does it the right way, so I'm hoping he gets it. And you know, during the season, during the during his off weeks, you always see him at Vanderbilt home games. He 100%. always comes back and is just there, yeah. proud proud to be there. But speaking of that, Jordan, I got to tell you, we got some Commodores in the house. We got OJ. Okay. We got Dwayne Jones. And Sorry. we got my blindside tackle from high school. I love You're it. You're not going to believe this, Mr. Patrick Fitch. I love it. I love Patrick it. The year behind me, and I outweighed him at quarterback. He was my left tackle. And anyway, Pat and I go way back. But uh, he says to tell you hello, Mr. Achievement. Tell, tell myself what's up. Bigger than your left tackle. That's crazy. It, it was. And our, and our right tackle was huge. And yeah. was not the best line. Anyway, that's another day, another story. You uh, almost walked on at Auburn. Yes, sir. What happened? How'd you end up in Nashville, not in Auburn? So, um, so going into my senior year, I had no offers, right? Now, what I did was that summer, um, I went to Auburn, Mississippi State, and Vanderbilt. I went to all three of their camps. Mm -hmm. Auburn crushed it. Mississippi State crushed it. But when I went to Vanderbilt, <clears throat> I was having a great day. Um, there was another quarterback there that was committed to Georgia Tech. And I kind of could tell, like, he was the best one of the group. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I went over to him. I said, hey, man, every time you get up in one-on-one -on -one lines, I'm going to get up at the same time. Like, I'm trying to go every rep with you. His name was Sinjin Day. So I still remember to this day because how much of an impact he had on my career. And so, um, he, I mean, we were just dotting him. Boom, boom, boom. And so um, there was one point where um, Bobby Johnson was standing in the middle of the field. And I said, Sinjin, throw me a post. I'm going to catch it right past uh, Bobby. And he threw it to me, caught it. And I was like, they got they got it. They got to give me the offer at this point. Um, no offer came, but they ended up talking to me about gray shirt. And they said, hey, we were going to come and recruit you. Um, but as they were coming to recruit me, they had four slots already filled. Trent Pruitt, Chris Boyd, my boy John DeKraus, and Bradley Roby, who's still in the NFL right now playing corner. So their slots were full. So I got to the end of my high school career and had no offers at all. I mean, none. I had no Division One, Division Two, in it like Faulkner University. I had nothing. I mean, people are like, they can't fathom it. But I'm like, there was nobody that ever went Division One for my high school. Mm -hmm. So I thought I could go Division One. So I wasn't really like talking to like any of the Division Two schools or things like that. We weren't even sending tapes to them. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't on their radar. And the schools whose radar I was kind of on, I wasn't in their minds good enough to get that offer. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of stuck in no man's land. And so um, I thought about even um, – I was actually in Publix one day and I saw a guy with the Alabama a and polo on. And I was like, he's got to be a coach. Mm -hmm. So I went to him. I found out he was a coach. I said, hey, man, I got my 
highlight film in my car right now. I, I was like, I was selling mixtapes or something. Mm -hmm. And so I said, um, I'll go to my car, I'll get it, you know, um, and tell me what you think. I go to my car, give it to him. Never hear back from him. So at that point, I'm like, okay, if I'm not going to get an offer, I know I can play in the SEC. Like I knew for, I, I like in my mind, I was like, I know if I get on that stage, mm -hmm. I'll be just fine. Mm -hmm. So of all the schools that I felt like were good enough academically that I could get into, um, that would also like be a good football program, Auburn was number one. So um, I started telling like, I think I probably at most maybe told my dad like, hey, like, I think I'd like to go to Auburn if, if I could go to a school. And then I knew once I got there, I was going to try and walk on. But Bradley Roby ended up decommitting Christmas Eve. I got the call from Robert Caldwell that night. And then I committed instantly. And so that was it. That's my only offer at the, at the house is Vanderbilt. That's a pretty good Christmas present. Yeah, yeah really good. Mm -hmm. So you, you end up coming up to – other than the camp, had you taken any recruiting visits, official or unofficial, to Nashville? Had you met any of the, the team? I, when I say I met at unofficials to Nashville, I had some unofficials to Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. I had an unofficial to Auburn. Mm -hmm. Dude, I had a crazy weekend this one week. I went to the Egg Bowl. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the Iron Bowl when Cam Newton came back against mm -hmm. Alabama. So I like watched back, that. Back live. to back days. Because back to back days. Friday. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I was on the field watching Cam. Like I was like, "Yo, this is where I gotta get to this level." Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, and so I I had done all those, but like when I went to Mississippi State, I remember Dan Mullen saying hi to everybody, and you know these coaches, man, when their minds are going, mm -hmm. they're talking at you, not to you, most yeah. of the time. They're just, and that's just the name of the game. Yeah. And I remember Dan Mullen like walked up, "Hey, how you doing?" He looked at me, and in his eyes. I felt like he had no idea who the heck I was. Wow. I was like, I'm not getting an offer here. And it was no, I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the game. But sure. um, but I was just kind of like, you know, there will be more of a connection, at least if they really saw me being a part of their family. Mm -hmm. And I felt that when it was when I would come to Vanderbilt. So we knew there was a chance that they might finally come around, but we kept waiting, kept waiting, kept waiting, and um, it never came. And then, obviously, it, once Christmas Eve happened, then I thought and – it, and it's funny that, you know, you go through those things as a high schooler. Now, I don't think a lot of these kids – I sound like one of those old guys, kids these days, right? Um, they don't appreciate a lot of the opportunities they have when it comes to college football as much because it's so, like, I deserve – this offer. I deserve this NIL deal. I deserve this. Man, when I was being recruited, I was like, if somebody gives me a chance, mm -hmm. I'm going to work harder than everybody in that building. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, coaches included. I mean, because when you don't get an offer week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, you, you the the point where you think you should be entitled to anything that's gone after week three by halfway through your high school season now you're just like now you're kind of pissed off and like man if i get this offer i'm gonna prove everybody wrong then by week eight that goes away you ain't even got time to be mad at nobody you're just praying now you're just leaning on god once your whole high school career ends and you have no offers i remember being i had the ball in my hands on the last kick return um, at the end of the game. So I had the ball. I got tackled. We lost in the semifinal, and we were undefeated up to that point. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, like, what I just told you, like, if, if I get a chance to go to a college, they have no clue how committed I'm going to be to their program. Like, like you think you're recruiting me? I'm recruiting you. Like, I'm literally like, please, like, you have no clue um, uh, what I would do if you give me that opportunity. And, and I, I don't see that as much with kids nowadays, um, unfortunately, because that's what makes it fun. That's how I can be a 10-year NFL vet and not be called until October to go sign with the Panthers. But I'm like, I, I was here when I was 17. Mm -hmm. I'm right at home. I'll be ready. And then, you know. It works out. You know what you just described so eloquently, it's the modern athlete, not all of them, 
but a lot because maybe because of social media. I, I don't know what has evolved, but there's almost like a sense of entitlement. It's like you you know who I am, so you need to come to me as opposed to the hunger, the chip on the shoulder, the always the burning is what I'm hearing from you, that desire to continually prove people wrong. Right. Come to Madison Academy, which was not a powerhouse football team and Madison coming out of North Alabama during your days, right. you, you put the school on the map basically by doing what you did and, and what you have done. Now, but Jordan, coming out of, of Madison, and, and as you said, you you listed off those other Chris Boyd and the other fellows who were already committed. Right. You, you had a very crowded wide receivers class and wide receivers room. Mm -hmm. But before you got to Vanderbilt, certainly you saw what Cutler and Bennett and those fellows had been doing. Right. Any of that factor into your mindset as to what you thought you might be able to create on the field? Or or is that not really part of the the, the mindset going in? Well, no, I, I watched Earl mm -hmm. um, when I was probably about a sophomore. Because my – crazy enough, my first ever handwritten letter mm -hmm. was from Coach Caldwell at Vanderbilt. So it was – like I'm taking my recruitment was weird because you would have thought a guy with one offer, you know, mm -hmm. you wouldn't think that your first handwritten letter would be from an SEC school. So I thought it was like, oh, this is about to be mm -hmm. easy. And then years go by, and it's like, wait, this is only handwritten. <laughs> oh, God. So it's from my boy, oh, Robbie. So, so you know, I had an awareness of like Earl Bennett, and I was like, yo, that that's that's the man. And I and I always kind of liked like that guy who was the man, but not at a school with all the big dogs. Like, it's easy to be the best corner when you got a D line like Alabama. Like, we don't know how good you are. You know what I'm saying? They, Alabama quarterbacks dealt with that for years. Now we've seen a change, but we never knew how good they were because you were surrounded by talent. Well, we knew Earl Bennett was good. Yeah. Like, we knew Jay Cutler was good because they had to carry mm -hmm. Vanderbilt at those times. So I was aware, but if I could really go back and say, like, what was my – like, what got me thinking, like, higher than – what the standard was at that point. One was my relationship to Jerry Rice. So there was always a standard for me, just with our family, was you catch the ball, you go score. This is what you did. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first thing. I didn't care about looking weird. Like, I didn't care about catching the ball and running to the end zone, like what people were thinking of me. Like, what's, why is the two-star recruit with one offer doing the most? It's like, well, this is what my family does. Like, we always go the extra mile. That was the first thing. Um, I would say number two was um, I remember going to games, you know, and, and these guys are my – I still have a ton of respect for – I got a ton of respect for John Cole. Like, he was actually a very, very good football player. Um, and as a returner, too. But him and Udom, we go out in these games and we'd finish the game and it would be like, you know – Three catches were here for like 30 yards, two catches here for maybe 24 yards, some good blocking over here. And we go watch the film, and that would be like the whole story. Mm -hmm. But then I'd go home and watch college football final, and I'd see that Des Bryant went for 140. And I'm like, surely there's more. Mm -hmm. Like, like surely. And so by the time I got, like, I started, like, working. And it was funny. I was with Jamie Graham today because, you know, he's the new head coach of Lipscomb. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking. And Jamie said, Jordan, I still remember when you first came to campus. I said, I remember, too, I was going against you, Casey Hayward, and Sean Richardson. <laughs> and I was just like, the, like, I've got to – if I can beat these guys, yeah. sure, like, surely I can do it out there on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. And so I just started honing. I'm like, if I get on that field, then I'm going to try and switch this whole narrative. And I just practice the way I practice, the Matthews way kind of um, obviously passed down by Jerry Rice. Um, but I knew in my head, I'm like, I see myself having 100 yards. I see myself having those Des Bryant, A.J. Green numbers. And then when I got to the end of the season, um, I had a touchdown in four straight games. Bang, bang. It was like uh, Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, Wake Forest. Ended the season with the most touchdowns on the team. Mm -hmm. You know, got freshman of the year. So I was like, okay, now what's next? 
And I know we're going to probably get into James uh, and, how, and his impact on me. But I was talking to my mom about this because I called James yesterday to talk to him. They had that whole um, thing with uh, J- Jay Gruden and RG3 had this huge spat over social media. It was, it was very ugly, honestly, yeah, to that. say the least. And um, I was listening to a, to this one podcast. These guys were talking about the situation between Jay and RG3. And this guy was like, you know, what a terrible – way for your relationship with your head coach to play out in front of everybody and the guy was like, i never had bad relationships with my head coaches i started thinking to myself i've had great relationships with my head coaches james franklin you know um robbie caldwell um chip kelly like these guys are kyle shanahan frank wright have great relationships with my head coaches so i say i gotta start calling these guys up more just talking to them you know because because once I'm done playing, then they can be like, what you call it? You call, you call it me for something. Because everybody calls them for something. I'm, like, I'm, I'm just trying to talk to you. Sure. And let you know how much I appreciate you. But I told my mom, I said, Mom, like, I didn't even realize James Franklin called me into his office. It was maybe like during spring. I'd had some really good practices. He knew I was coming off of a successful freshman year. And he knew I had a lot of potential. He called me in his office after one bad practice that I had in spring. And he said, Jordan, watch these plays. Is this your standard? And I was like, no, this this isn't good enough. He said, this offense, I'm going to put you at the Z. The last two guys that played the Z in this offense in in college football, Torrey Smith in Maryland, Jordy Nelson in Kansas State. And those numbers that I thought of popped in my head. Mm -hmm. Both second-round picks, both very successful in the NFL. And I thought to myself, I was like, Whatever you say, let's do that. I told my mom the other day, I said, Mom, I didn't even realize I was an 18-year-old kid. That was a million-dollar conversation that that man was having with me that day. That was a million-dollar conversation. He literally said, I'm going to put you in a position. If you listen to me, you're going to be able to take care of your family for a very long time. And he was right. And, Jordan, we all in our career, regardless of how far we go in our sports career, we all have those defining moments, whether right. it's the, the time that your career takes off or it's the time that your career comes to an end. At what point, you're an 18-year-old kid, you have this conversation with your new head coach, James Franklin, but at what point in your life did that resonate with you that that was the, I'm going to call it the jumping off point, the starting mm-hmm. point that propelled you to, to more success? You already had some success, mm-hmm. but your coach – did what he what he's supposed to do, but at what point, what age were you when you realized, man, that conversation is one of those defining ones of my career? Yeah, you know, um, if I had to say, because some of these revelations don't even come until mm-hmm. um, till later, that's mm-hmm. sadly, you know, um, but at least they come and then you can act on them. Mm-hmm. But I would say there was actually a defining moment where I was like, I can do this. And I think I can make money doing this um, is when we played Florida in the swamp my sophomore year, because the beginning of my sophomore year started off kind of slow. And I mean, it was just a tough slate of games. Then it culminated with going to Bama. That wasn't a great outing for any of us. I mean, I remember just that that team, Drake or Patrick, Mark Barron. I think they had like Courtney Upshaw then, maybe CJ Mosley, Dante Hightower. I mean, it was I mean, they were stacked. You know, all Sunday, but, uh, guys, every one of them. R- right, exactly. But I was still a Bama kid, so I wanted to do well in that game. Yeah. And to end that game with zero catches, you know, I remember Franklin actually making me take a back seat. I went from being the number one to that next game versus Arkansas. Like, I was only in a receiver. I was supposed to, only supposed to be in on, like, one play when we were uh, in empty. Like, I, like, he had demoted me because mm-hmm. – I wasn't producing at the rate that he felt like I should have. And Chris Boyd, I think Chris had like two or three touchdowns. They had a touchdown versus Elon. He had a touchdown versus UConn. And mm-hmm. They should have put him in. They should have gave him some more tick because, you know, I wasn't um, I wasn't capitalizing on the opportunity at that moment. So we get in the Arkansas game, and we finally get into the empty set. I had the juke, and um, j Raj throws to me. I catch it, catch a run, go score. I end up going for like 130 that game. Mm-hmm. So that's how I regained the starting spot. 
-hmm. when we went down to we either went down yeah we went down to florida that next week though Mm -hmm. when i went for 171 in a touchdown florida not giving up uh 100 yards to a receiver that whole year Mm -hmm. and so when i went down there and i caught for 171 i mean i caught the stick i caught a corner route for a touchdown i had a 14 yard comeback outside had the hitch um, I mean, I, I ran every route. I had the one-handed fade on the sideline. Um, at that point, I was like, I almost went for 200 on probably the best secondary mm-hmm. in the country. Yeah, like, I can probably um, make some money doing this. And and I just loved it. I mean, look, I, I'm still going today because I love the game. And um, I remember – talking to the former GM who I still owe a ton to um, um, uh, Scott Fitter, who uh, was the, was the former GM of the Panthers. I remember talking to him when they were thinking about signing me and everything. And um, I told him, I said, you know, I said, I'm telling you right now, like, I know I've had some injuries. I know I'm later in my career, but I guarantee you, there is not there there might be two percent of the NFL that loves football as much as I do. Mm-hmm. That literally, if you say I need you to do this for my team, I'll do it because I love the game and I respect the game. And that's what's kept me around so long. I had a talk with uh Larry Lathers uh recently, mm-hmm. and he was just like, you know, he was like, Man, Jordan, everybody's story is so different. And you know, he that's what he says. Like, I think that's what's helped you stick. And I said, I'm telling you, man, if you, if I'm not in your building, then you have to relegate me to a piece of paper. Okay. He's 31. He's a former receiver. He had ACL. He, um, you know, he switched positions. Well, that doesn't look good on paper. If I'm in your building, you're going to be like, no, I, I want this guy hitched up to me. That's how I stayed with the Niners for four years, you know, and, and, but I've been that way. Like ever since, and so, um, but that that game versus Florida was the one. Now we had like 130 uh, against Kentucky the next week, and that was those Des Bryant, AJ Green numbers that I was kind of envisioning all the time. That's I've, I've, I've got so many things I want to unpack on though. What you just beautifully said, you being in the NFL now, going on your tenth season. You're now in that less than 1% of all players who've ever played. I know you know that. And Mm -hmm. also knowing you from a distance and following your career, now knowing you personally, you're, you're not all about the statistics. You're not all about the, the, you know, the back of the Jersey. You're about the front of the Jersey. We, we know that. And that's what we appreciate about who you are on and, and off the field. But here's my question for you. I want to go back to when you got benched. Mm-hmm. To be a successful athlete, particularly a, a, a professional, as long as you have, we all, regardless of, of where you where one accomplishes in their sport, we all have that confidence as an athlete. Yeah. I know what I got to do. I don't have doubts because if I start having doubts, then I'm not going to produce or I'm going to get hurt, that kind of thing. But here's my question for you, Jordan. When you got demoted, had you lost any of that confidence? Did it shake any of your fortitude? And if it did, how did you get it back? What motivated you? You explained a little bit of it. You saw Chris Boyd do what he did, Mm. but there had to have been more there. Take us to that confidence and whether you got shaken and what did you do to get it back? Yeah, you know, honestly, um, I think that humbling was was what I needed. Like, I I, I truly believe that – they say that things will happen uh, to you. They happen for you. Right. And I just remember that Elon game. I didn't, I didn't come out with the right mindset that I would have needed to go the distance that I did at Vanderbilt. And what do I mean by that? You know, we came out to that game. um, I could probably pull up the picture. I I remember I had like this fresh pair of cleats, these pearly white gloves. Like I was just like, I was so all about, myself like and and I'd put in the work like trust me like there was never a point you wouldn't have known it just from talking to me because I could have given you the politically correct it's Mm -hmm. all about the team it's all about winning Mm -hmm. but internally I knew I'm the next Jordy Nelson and Torrey Smith in this offense Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I've got this ball play. I've got this play. I've got this play that they got for me. Like, this is my time. I'm 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 gonna look good. I'm gonna go. Out. That's not Jordan Matthews. And I'm telling you to this day, when I say the fine line I have to be at to play at a high level, I can I can never get outside of that. The second I get outside of that, my game just falls off a cliff. It just does. Um, I don't I don't know. I don't know why that's the cross I'm I'm meant to, to bear. Mm-hmm. I have three sons. And I think maybe the Lord was just like, I don't ever want you to go look like a fool because you got three young men to raise. Mm-hmm. I want them to see, you know, a, a blue collar, relatable, hardworking guy that mm-hmm. all of your sons can can get something from. Because I got three boys like who knows one's journey in sports might be different than the other. You know, I, I don't want to represent something that only one of them could relate to. I want to represent something that it doesn't matter who it is. It could be the guy working in the cafeteria, you know, uh, the girl on the cheerleading team or one of my sons playing basketball. Like they're like, that's how it's supposed to be done. So when I got demoted, it was honestly freeing. It was freeing Mm. because like I said, I went to that Bama game and still mentally, I was like, I'm about to go. This is the game. I'm finally going to have a big game. It's going to be against Alabama back in my home state. And when you have zero catches, you're like, this ain't about you. Like, you really – sometimes it's good to look in the mirror and say you're really not as good as you think. Mm-hmm. So then you actually got to start, like, depending on that training and depending on those fundamentals that your coach has been trying to get you to buy into the entire time. And so at that point, it was freeing. I was like – you got to remember, the Florida game had not happened yet. Mm-hmm. So I did not think that I was an NFL-caliber player yet. I just thought that maybe in the system I could have some numbers in college. Mm-hmm. And so once that wasn't happening, I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I'm not even that. So I just went to the game, like whatever job they got for me, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to be like all the other kids and go get a good degree in economics. Mm-hmm. But um, when I caught that um, juke route and just ran and scored, I was like, okay. Like that kind of felt like, it felt like that freshman year when I got in the end zone. And then they put me on a stutter go catch. They had another catch across the middle on a dagger. And then we had a two-minute drive. Ball was up there. I remember turning, one-handed catch. I think it was left-handed, you know, back shoulder. And at that point, I was like, okay. Like, but I remembered my mindset going to that game. I didn't, I didn't care about how I looked. I didn't care about my swagger. I just wanted to just go play. And so I was free the rest of my time there. And that's – that's just who I am. That's how I play my best football. I, I will tell you that is a a rare insight mm-hmm. to the position that you play yeah. and the expectations that you had, but you were able to put it within the team concept. 100%. And, and frankly, Jordan, that's if, – if I've heard so many accolades and descriptions of, of positivity about you, the best one that I think is the fact that you are such a team player. You, you were going to get what you were going to get, but it was also going to be within the concept of the team. Jordan, mm-hmm. we got a whole bunch of folks here that want to say hello to you. So let me do some roll call here. We got Robin Giltner. We got Kenny Cole from Huntsville, who remembers you during high school with North Alabama FCA. Not just an athlete, a man of character. That's coming. Hey, man. Yep. Nice to meet you, Kenny. We got Steve. Oh, and, and I'm going to come back. Kenny, I'm going to come back to your event in just a minute. We got Steve Tress. We've got oh gosh, Jordan. I'm sorry. We, we've been you and I've been talking so much. There's been so many guys to roll through. I, I missed yeah. some up. Oh good. Four or five others, guys. We're I've just got chopping, shot, man. We're chopping it up. We are. We got number 87. We got the most decorated wide receiver, maybe most decorated Vanderbilt Commodore in program history. But Jordan, I want you to take us to the lowest point which you may have just hit in your Vanderbilt career. And then I want you to take us to your highest point of your you. career. Yeah, it, it probably happened, um, what, 12 weeks apart. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the lowest. The lowest point uh, was the Ole Miss game, my senior year. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like I said, it, it's, just, it's crazy the lessons you learn real time um, just playing the game. And that's probably um, – I'm not going to go off on another tangent, but it's probably why I can't let it go. Because, you know, whenever I see somebody 
uh, going like skydiving, I'm like, man, their job must not be that exciting. Cause like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, they gotta, they, I mean, it's cool, but they gotta find that thrill somewhere. Like I find this thrill in playing football because I feel every emotion on a Sunday. I felt every emotion on a Saturday, fear, joy, happiness, sadness, like all the whole spectrum I would feel. And I think I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm almost addicted to that feeling like going into battle and feeling all those things. And, um, I remember that old Miss game because, you know, we went in, stadium was packed, mm-hmm. first game of ESPN. We had the first game of college football last year versus South Carolina, mm-hmm. came up short um, in a very close game versus Clowney and all those guys, DJ Swearinger, Connor Shaw, Marcus Lattimore, and we we, we took them to the wire. Mm-hmm. So they gave us that, that, that first time slot again. So, like, I, I remember, because I'll come back and help the guys, over at Vanderbilt, I will show them that game. And I'll say, go look at the stands. If you guys put a product out there on the field that these that this alumni will be proud of, they will show up. Mm-hmm. I'm like, they're, they're like cicadas. They'll just come out the ground. They will show up and they will fill up that <laughs> I've never heard that before, but that and Trust is, me. Are they awesome. hiding. They hiding, but they there. They there. Because I've seen they're them. like cicadas. <laughs> and they love you. And, I t- and they love you. I'm Look. And I played in Philly where the fans are crazy. And I've got great love uh, with a lot of Philly fans. Man, Vanderbilt fans, that when they, when they, when you're one of them, they love you. Mm-hmm. And, and I just remember that whole place being packed. We wanted to win bad for them and get off on a good start. So that game, I think I had like close to like 80 or 90 in the first half, had a 60 yard touchdown. So I was having a great game. Um, I had a full body cramp, had to go inside. They gave me an IV. Crowds held the game together. Then I came back, and then we both started – we still were playing well. It was like fourth and 18, and if we don't get this conversion, the game's over. Mm-hmm. And Austin Carr Samuels, you know, like is about to – well, we called the play in. I had just come off the field because I had been cramping. I took a hit. I was throwing up. They thought I was concussed. Mm-hmm. And so they pulled me out the game. Even if I was concussed, I wasn't coming out that game. Uh, they they pulled me to the sideline and they were trying to do the whole protocol thing for me. I'm like, look, it's Saturday, it's eight o'clock, my name's Jordan. And the second I realized we were, that, that that play was going in, I went out there. Um, Franklin saw me go in, and Franklin's a G. He didn't ask if my head was okay. He knew what time it was. So we called the dagger and up. And um we had run the, the end cut on them so much that game. I'd already caught two. Um, so we ran the dagger and up first quarters, beat the safety. Austin throws it up. We catch the ball. Then we throw it to Steven Show. Next play, touchdown. And I kid you not, even though I'm not on defense, I relax in that moment. I've been through so much that game, just the mental exhaustion, the physical exhaustion, everything, like full body cramp, could barely see, threw up on the field. To go out there, catch the ball on fourth and like 20, Mm-hmm. Put us in, and then we score with like a minute left. Like I, I felt my spirit relax. Like mm-hmm. we got it. Mm-hmm. Like we, we got this one. We, mm-hmm. Kedichi, Hugh Freeze, mm-hmm. Evan Ingram, Laquan Trevor. I'm talking names right now. Mm-hmm. I said we got them. Like, and Jeff Scott on a random read, like you know, read option. 80 yards mm. and the next drive I run a scene and I remember bending around the linebacker and the ball was on me before I could see it and I jumped up to try and get it and it went on my hands and it got picked mm. and that was the game so I went like from here to like I didn't I want to crawl under you know Dudley Field I was I didn't want anybody to look at me but the whole time, I'm very honest with myself. I've always that, and if there has there ever been a trait that I feel like um, I got, probably from my from my father, because um, he was always honest with us, like when it came to like how we were doing in sports. I was like, we lost that game because I relaxed, and I and I know I I wasn't on defense when Jeff Scott, um, you know, scored a touchdown, but I was thinking in my head, I was like, when I relaxed. That like that's not how you win games. That's not the mindset you're supposed to have when you're trying to win at this level. When you're trying to have a, the first 10 win season since World War II, 
there is no relaxing in a game. And um, and I just remember that being a very low point. I went back to the uh, dorm room. You know, people go out. Dude, I, I was not about to go out. I was like, I just sat there and I, we watched the replays on ESPN. I was just thinking like, you know, that should have been our time. The moment came back around, though, versus Wake Forest. Mm-hmm. And it was the last game of my senior year. It was fourth and 18. Mm-hmm. Same situation. If we don't convert, it's game over. And, I mean, they've been shadowing me. Uh, God, I don't know how I forgot his name. His last name is Johnson. He played in the league for a little bit, too. Really good corner. Long athletic. He'd been going me the whole game, and so I knew I'm like, okay, he's going to be on me. They'll probably bring some type of safety over knee, over top. Um, fourth and 18, Carter drops back, and he knew. He's like, I'm going to J-Mat. Throws it up, bring it down, and you'll see me, like, the sense of urgency. I catch it. I'm like, get the ball to the ref. Carry Spirit kicks it, and then we end up winning that game. But my mindset the entire time was this thing is not over. Carry's got to make the kick. I'm talking to the defense like we need to stop. And mm-hmm. and I learned, like, you got to learn how to play winning football. And that was my first, like, you know, I don't, and who knows, like, I know I'm going to coach my sons. You know, I've had a long career and maybe I'll coach when I'm done. But that lesson of it ain't over to that clock hit zero, mm-hmm. I learned that that old miss game. So it was a tough moment for me. But, um, you know, if we would have won 10 games that year, and I would have had that game. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm i like, I tell my son, just, I mean, Jojo, they have a statue of you, Dad. <laughs> but um, but it, it wasn't meant to be. Maybe he'll maybe he'll go to Vanderbilt one day and get us that 10-1 season. Hopefully it don't take that long. But, you know, um, but that was definitely the lowest point. Well, I, I will tell you, you describing pretty nonchalantly one of the most famous catches in Vanderbilt football history because for as much of an athlete as you are and as much as you have trained your mind and your body in that muscle memory to make certain plays look effortless, kind of like the way, and and I mean this with the utmost compliment, Mm -hmm. I used to complain that Ken Griffey Jr. just loafed. He lagged. He didn't do anything that the old vets, he wore his hat backwards. He didn't like he was trying. He was trying all right. He just had better skill set than anybody on the field. Here's, right. and, and what I mean by this is, Jordan, that catch, I still remember that catch, and I told you that about six months ago when I saw you on campus. Yeah. That catch is one of the most memorable catches in Vanderbilt football history. And how you made that catch is still, even if you wa- we watch it over and over and over, how in the world did this man come up with this ball? Now, it, to you, it may have been just another ball, and another important game, and another catch. But to the rest of us, that kind of cemented, at least in our minds, and I'm speaking for my my generation of fans, that catch will never go away. That catch is, is, and I hope it's as memorable to you as it is to to us. And it seems like it it sticks in your mind a little bit. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, And, you know, even when – I remember seeing some of my teammates when we came back for the uh, – we had, like, a reunion. They kind of um, mm-hmm. honored us for when we won. I think it was the Music City Bowl one. That was the one. It might yeah. have been the – or it might have been the Compass Bowl. No, it was the Compass Bowl that I just went to They oh. uh, that they commemorated. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, some of the guys, they'll still say, man, I, w- I remember, like, being on the sideline and just – when you caught it over there, and I was like, dude, guys, there, there's nothing more that I enjoy than seeing my guys mm-hmm. feel that feeling that so many other people used to feel when they would play us. I mean, just the disrespect. I was, I, It used to make me sick. And so to know, like, we could have that feeling, like, versus Tennessee, mm-hmm. like, ver- the, the, the hot man, when we beat Tennessee at home, my junior year, I mean, they had Tyler Bray, Cordero Patterson, mm-hmm. Justin Hunter. I think A.J. Johnson was a linebacker on that team. They had dudes. Yeah. We ran them out of the stadium. I mean, you talk about just like a fun game. Was that so, the was that the Pat and Robinette fake? That was that was in that was at 
too. I thought that, yeah, I thought that was a different year. Yeah. And that was, but once again, though, that mm -hmm. was another one where, you know, they used to feel that feeling all the time against us. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, and I used, and I, and I love, I love Vanderbilt fans because um, people already want to have a reason to dislike us. Like, oh, we're, it's the private school. Oh, they're, Either they're going to dislike us or dismiss us. And I think the second is the worst when they just act like you don't even matter. Yeah. So to give like my Vanderbilt people like bragging rights over some of these schools, like I'm like, that's the, I love playing for that, you know? So, um, but those are definitely some, some of those high moments, man. But um, when I look back on my college career, like I'm, I, I smile every time, like my cup is full with um, what we were able to do there. And I still go back, and I hope, I hope my sons go. I hope all three of my boys um, decide to be Commodores one day um, and, and help that program get to where it should be. Well, I, I can assure you, you put smiles on many faces of football alums, actual regular student alums, sidewalk alums, any fans during your years. But, Jordan, we've got Uncle Luke. Luke Uncle White Luke. sends some love your way. He loves you. Appreciate you. One of my teammates, one of my signing, my class, Mark Stump Johnson, is in All the right. house with us tonight. Let's see. And and I want to take just a quick break, Jordan. I want to, and I know I sent this to you the other day. Kenny Cole, who's still on with us, is an attorney in Huntsville. Kenny played in the 70s for us and is very awesome. active in our Facebook group. And he did this a couple of years ago, and he's revisiting it in February 23rd, 24th weekend. He's hosting Coach Lee. Hopefully some of the staff, maybe Candace, who knows who else is going to be coming down for the weekend. But he, Kenny and his wife, Jill, are opening their house for anybody who is, is part of our group to come down. Uh, hint, hint, Jordan, maybe you come down, see some family, bring the kids. Is it, is, it, is it in Huntsville? It is in Huntsville. So I, now I've got a way to go to in Hawaii. But I'm going to try and see if my, if my parents can go in my place because – they're oh, an extension for me. I would love for uh, one of us to be in that number. So I would I would guess my kids would be in Huntsville with my parents because me and my wife, I, I have a teammate, Kenny. I would I would be there um, if I could, but I do have a wedding obligation already of my teammate, Kamu, who plays with me at the Panthers. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I hate to give you the no on the RSVP this early, but um, okay. I'm going to see if my parents can go there because I do want us in that number. Well, thank you for that, Jordan. I know that they'd be very much welcomed at the Coles yeah. house and, and seeing everybody. I've got just a few more minutes that I want to spend with you. Come on, uh, Jordan. And I sure appreciate you just sharing your journey. And that's what these conversations with Commodores are all about. I'm, I'm not a journalist. I'm just yeah. an enthusiastic former player who's wanting to bring Love the community it. together. And we've done almost 200 of these over the last four and a half years. We're mm -hmm. telling the oral history of the Vanderbilt football program. And I'm so right. proud of these conversations, particularly with men like you, Jordan. You yeah. define, in my eyes, what it means to be a Commodore. Yeah. Not only were you proud to be a Commodore back then, but you wear yeah. it proudly every day since. Right. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jordan and his family live near Vanderbilt's campus. Yep. And he's there quite a bit still setting an example for the next generation of Commodores. And that's going to lead me to this, this question. You come into the building. I know folks who work there know you. I know that you have relationships with the, the guys on the team. But here's my question. And I'm not trying to make you feel like an old dude at, at 31, but these are 18 and 19-year-olds you're now dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the different generation, a different mindset yeah. of the younger athlete. You've hit on it a little bit tonight. Yeah. But now that you're 10 years in, into your pro career and you have the credibility that you do, do they listen? Do they just want to just chop it up with you just to say they talk with Jordan Matthews? Are they listening? Are they comprehending some of this life lessons you're sharing? Yeah, no, they understand. They're just the next generation. Um, I've learned that they're a lot more visual. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Um and you can't always bank on the fact that they all had this like upbringing that was just like had just had that just had an influx of just discipline and all the and this whole foundation right so what do i mean by that is like when i go back now like 
I'll sit down with them. We'll we'll say, hey, you know, I'm coming in town. I'll hit up Quincy. Uh, I mean, me and Junior got in the film room uh, at the beginning of last year, and I'll tell these guys, hey, let's get in the film room and let's let's talk some ball. Let's talk how I think about winning, you know, versus man coverage, how I think about identifying zone. The thing about the next generation is they are super visual, and you can't you can't BS them. Like because they know that I've done what they are doing now, mm-hmm. I already have that that connection to them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you can't speak to them in these vague terms. Like you can't just like, hey man, let's go. I'm like, go where? Like, you know, like, like they're in their minds are like, like they didn't come up like us. Like if I told an old school guy, hey man, let's go. His mind's thinking like, okay, well, my high school coach told me that that meant run through somebody's face. That's a good place to start in football. You know what I'm saying? So, but but this next generation, they need tangible advice. And I don't I don't blame them for that. Mm-hmm. There were coaches that I had for years that I was like, yeah, you motivated me, but you didn't equip me. Mm-hmm. You didn't equip me like to understand versus this coverage, this is how you win. Mm-hmm. This is what this DB is trying to protect. He's playing inside leverage for a reason. If you attack that, he has to respect it. Now you have more room to win outside. You know, like on this route, you have, but they're only going to commit if you turn your shoulder. That's what makes the DB do a slice technique because he thinks you're running the over. Now we can win on the sale. Like tangible tools. When you talk to them in that way, like they can't help but be like, I I, I completely understand what you're saying. I, I, would, I just don't clip after clip after clip after clip. I'll show him Julian Edelman doing it. I'll show him Justin Jefferson do it. I'll show them Jordan Matthews do it. I'll show them, uh, you know, a bigger body guy, you know, uh, DJ uh, DK Metcalf do it. I'm like, all these body types are winning with this technique. And so then they can't dispute it. And then they buy in and then they want. Like, you, if you're spending your time trying to be cool, you'll, you'll never be cool enough for them. You'll never be cool enough for them. What they respect is the truth. And I don't care what generation you're from, everybody wants to be told the truth. And if you tell them the truth, you may lose them for a day, but if you lie to them and BS them, you'll lose them forever. You see what I'm saying? So that's kind of always been my method. Um, I, I, I don't lead with um, just like, man, back in my day, I never say that stuff because I know somebody saw me and probably thought, Back in my day, I never acted like that kid. You know, we always do that to the next generation. So I've, I've made a commitment not to do that with them. Um, but I know for a fact the things that they want are still the same. When I was playing, I wanted to be able to take care of my family one day. I wanted to be able to have enough money to not have to worry about doing something I didn't want to do when I got done playing. Um, I wanted to have a long career, things like that. Well, the standard is still the same if you want those things. I don't care. Like, if you want those things in football, you are still going to have to master all these things that I'm trying to teach you. Mm-hmm. So I can still help you get there. I can be an asset to you, but here's how we got to do it. This is the standard. If you like it, if you, if you use it, you'll get there. Trent Sherfield, listen, he's never been cut in his life. Mm-hmm. Undrafted free agent mm-hmm. to Arizona, six straight years, has been on the 53-man roster from the start to the end of the season, every single year he's been in the NFL. Yeah, I was so rooting for him this past weekend. That was a yeah, hard yeah. Hey, we're gonna have we're gonna have a chance to root for him some more though because he's got a long career ahead of him. Yeah, he's a, he's a fantastic example of, of perseverance. Speaking of perseverance, we got Jimmy Arnold, the Detroit Lions pride in the house. Mm. Thank oh, you he's he's me. excited. He, he's oh. excited for this weekend, huh? Now, I don't know if the two of y'all are going to be able to speak this upcoming week with what's going on. What's that about? Dude, like I said, I know I mentioned the Niners because, you know, I want the Niners to win. I guess that's it's more family. Sure. You know, shout out to Oren. But um, I think the Lions are America's team right now. <laughs> you can't find somebody who would not want to see the Lions in there, man. Dan Campbell was the man. You know, they do things the right way. So, um, but, but I – the Niners are family, man. I want them to go ahead and uh, get in there. And I think most of us have, have kind of washed out of, of the Travis Kelsey and uh, 
the singer. I can't think of her name right now. That's just a title. Yeah, I, I don't even know who he's dating at all. So, <laughs> Oh, we got the mayor of Murfreesboro, one of my teammates, Joe okay. Peoples, one of your fraternity brothers in the house. Okay, what's up, baby? Yo, yo to the news. What up, baby? We got Tyler Unzicker. Thank you, fellas. We got just a couple more minutes with Jay Matt. I know he's got a house full and we've occupied his time uh, tonight. Y'all good, man. Y'all good. Y'all got this block. They asleep. Let's talk about the fact that we got two professional athletes as parents in the house and you've got <laughs> the athletes coming up. I know you got a yeah. five-year-old. How old are the others? Five, three, and one. Yep. Five, three, right. and one. Now and if you and if you gotta be yeah. there's gotta be some good cop, bad cop. I, I don't know, and I'm not trying to get into your family life, but no, you're good. putting a lot of pressure on that five-year-old when he knows that. Mom and dad. I don't know if it's registered with him yet, but mm -hmm. mom and dad, both professional athletes. And right. how's that? Are you dad? Are you coach? Are you coach dad? Well, the first thing I did was I did not name him Jordan. So I was like, that that was my and, and no shade, because I know like uh my boy Trent, his son is named Trent. If you want to do that, that's that's completely fine. I knew for me, I didn't want my son to have my exact same name because I didn't just just to 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 hopefully not have that situation happen where he feels like, you know, I got to live up to this, whatever. Um, it's also the reason, too, I'm not I, I'm his coach at home, kind of. But in front of people, I, I just let him go play. I'm like, just go play right now. You know, um, just go do your thing. But. I will, I will say this. If somebody were to question whether, like, Jordan, like, was that strategic? It was for love, but it was definitely strategic, too. <laughs> when I saw my wife, man, people don't know this. When my wife was at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. she played in 16 games one season and had 14 goals. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was about to break Vanderbilt's career goals record after only playing two years. Oh, two years, yeah. Then she left mm -hmm. and scored 10 goals and won a national championship mm -hmm. and was tournament MVP. I, she's unbelievable. And so when I went to a, I remember when she got to campus, I saw her and I, you know, people say, oh, you see somebody like, that's going to be my wife. I'm, one, I'm in that camp. Mm -hmm. Like I saw her and I said, you know, some some folks, some women you see, that's a good woman. Like, Man, I bet that's somebody's wife. I see her, I'm like, no, nah, she mine. Like, that's that's, that's me right there. And that was before I ever saw a game. Like, I just knew she looked amazing. She was beautiful. Um, still is. Um, but then when I remember going to a game, and, like, if you go to get to one of the 16, you're probably going to see one her score one of those goals. Mm -hmm. And she was just so good. And I was like, you know, um, I reckon if me and her have children, I probably will not have to pay for college. So some of this, man, you know, like I said, 100% for love. So if my wife sees this, 100% for love. But you got folks passing down, you know, real estate, crazy amounts of money, all this stuff down to their kids. And we're going to pass that stuff down too. But I'm like, I'm going to give you some hamstrings too and some quads and some, <laughs> and some abs. Like I'm passing down all that. So my son, man, like he's a, he, he, he's he's pretty special. He, we at um, I think he'll he'll do just fine. But I'm I'm a huge proponent of this too, and I, I'm and I mean this in all seriousness, because I know his mom's so gifted, and because you know I come from an athletic family, I like that too. Because now I can just focus on I, if your kid is if my kid was not did not have a lot of athletic ability. Mm -hmm. I would be so afraid to push him a little bit too hard right now mm -hmm. because in my mind, I still feel like there's a standard that should be out there when you're competing mm -hmm. because he's athletic enough. Now I can just focus on the main two things. Hey man, listen to your coaches mm -hmm. and do your best. Mm -hmm. And I can just let him go be athletic. And now I know like, I don't need to be, you know, over the top at all. And then as once he starts getting into grade school, middle school, then the same disciplinarian I am at home, then I'm going to start being like, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this? You tell me, yes, sir. 
there's a standard. We're going to watch the standard. You want to do soccer? Okay, let's watch your mom. She's a national champion. National champion. Okay, let's watch Messi. Let's watch Mbappe. How do these guys practice? How do this is the standard if you want to do this? But it's not that time yet. So I'm just enjoying the playing. You know who's you know who's radar that he's already on? James Franklin. James Franklin, Jeff Brothers, Rock Batten. I could keep going on and on yeah. about the Vanderbilt connection in the Metro <laughs> football yeah. scene. Yeah. So, Franklin already texted Franklin texted me yesterday. He said they all got off. He just hit me up. He did. Yeah, he asked for you need to screenshot that. But oh yeah, no, trust me, I'm holding to it. Trust me. Right. Hey, nothing, hey, nothing leaves the iPhone. We got it forever. So that's, I'm holding that's to right. it. Jordan, I could talk to you for the next three hours. It is mm -hmm. so enjoyable to get to know you, to learn your story, and 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 just frankly, as as much as you've accomplished and as humble as you have remained, you are the pride I know of your family. I know that you're in in, in your school and in your community so thank you for just being who you are and just just keep being who yeah. you are. so thank you number 87 man bernard appreciate you man like i said when you told me we were going to do this um it was no hesitation um anything i can ever do uh just for the vanderbilt community i'm always um i'm always thankful and like i said it was my only offer um i i don't think people realize how much like w when i'm online before I even post anything, I think, how will this represent, you know, Vanderbilt? And I'm almost I'm 10 years plus removed. Um, but I think about that. Like, I know that, you know, there are people affiliated with that school who have kids that watched me, you know, and they're like, oh, he's the guy that played. I, w I think about those things. You know, I'm by no means perfect. I'm just as flawed as any human on God's green earth. Um, I had just had happened to have a great career um, college wise there, but I do I take that very seriously though. Like being an ambassador, like when people see me, when I come back to the school, I want I want them to see me with that wedding ring on. Like oh, he found himself a bride. When I come back the next year, I want them to see me with my son. When I come back the next year, I want them to see me with another son. When I come back, I want them to. I want them to believe in what Vanderbilt produces. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. it does. And, um, and and I take a lot of I take a lot of pride in that. I really do, you know. So um I like I said, I appreciate you having me on. Um, everybody for coming and listening to the old vet talk for a little bit. So um yeah, I appreciate all you guys. Next time you're in that wide receivers room, you need to remind them and keep reminding them about that obligation for social media who they yep. represent because yep. good gosh, some of not, not our guys, but yep. just in general, if they don't have a filter. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I know I do. I, I think I need to, um, but I've got to develop a consistency with them. If there, if there's one thing I've learned now is like, mm -hmm. if you're really going to more, more is caught than taught. So if I go in there and I tell you one day, like, Hey, you shouldn't do this. Even if they listen to that one day, they've got so they're inundated with so much mm -hmm. that, they'll forget what I said two months down the road. Sure. But if I can really develop that relationship, which, you know, I want to start doing, that, especially like with a kid like a junior Cheryl, now I can really like help them understand like, hey, I'm not just trying to be another person in your ear trying to control you. Yeah. I'm trying to show you that these are pitfalls other people have made, mistakes they made. You don't got to go that way. This is the best fast track to where you're trying to get in life. So, um, I, but you're 100% right, man. Some of the stuff they say, I'm just like, uh, like you are not going to wish you said that. Well, I from that. hope that whatever's going on inside of Magoogan right now produces a whole lot of cicadas coming out this season. Come on. We need them out. We need the cicadas out here. We need them out the ground. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Jordan, as always, my friend, anchor down. See you Anchor guys down, baby. Yes, sir.